All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us. Uh, we're excited for this webinar. And my name is Matt Tao. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons out at University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. Uh, my specialty is primarily knee surgery, so a lot of different complex knee issues, one of which is cartilage problems. And we're very honored and grateful to have Courtney with us today. Courtney is one of our Macy ambassadors. And so she has a very unique story and unique perspective on this uh, and has been willing to tell her story with us today. So we're grateful for that. And Courtney, thank you for being here. No problem. Thanks for having me. Well, good. Well, we are excited for this and we're certainly hopeful that it's useful for the viewers. I think this is something that people have tremendous uh, anxiety about, questions about to know what is it like going through a cartilage problem. Um, presumably some of the, the viewers out there will have cartilage issues of their own. Certainly there's individualized aspects to this always, but um, getting your thoughts on how this developed, what your options were, why you chose Macy and, and the road to recovery, I think will be really helpful for people. So. Maybe we'll just start by, if you don't mind, give us just a rundown of your story. Like, where did this all start and uh, and how things got rolling from that perspective with your knee? Sure. Um, so I think my knee journey probably started when I was in high school. Um, I tore my ACL playing field hockey when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. Um, and I, you know, had my ACL fixed and I, you know, recovered um, and I went on to play, you know, sports my senior year of high school um, and I was fine. Um, you know, I did really well um, all throughout college, um, throughout grad school. Um, instead of playing more competitive sports, when I got out of high school, I started running instead. So that was, you know, my kind of primary um, physical activity and exercise for all those years. Um, and I did well probably for about 10 years after my ACL. And then I started having some pain in the same knee. Um, initially, it started off as, you know, just sort of like a dull, achy pain. Um, I didn't really think much of it, um, but I would notice it when I was exercising and running. Um, and I, I let it go probably for, you know, maybe longer than I than I should have. Um, but over the course of about like a year and a half, two years, um, you know, it progressed to the point where I, you know, needed to basically stop running because I was having so much pain. My knee was swelling. Um, I was having a lot of trouble at work. Um, I have a pretty active job and I'm on my feet all the time. Um, you know, and by the end of the day, I was limping. Um, I was having a hard time going up and down stairs. Um, you know, so at this point, you know, I figured I probably should, you know, see someone about this and kind of figure out what's going on. I think in the back of my mind, I was worried that I would be told that I would, you know, need surgery again, or maybe that something was wrong with my ACL graft. So that probably, you know, I think in the beginning kind of made me put off the idea to go um, and see someone. But eventually I made my way to sports medicine and had some imaging done, first an x-ray, um, then eventually I had an MRI. Um, and they did identify, I think, what's called a cyclops lesion with my ACL graft, um, but then they also found a cartilage defect um, that I, you know, that I wasn't expecting to have. And so that sort of opened up the door, you know, to discuss my cartilage defect and, and Macy and what the next steps would be from there. So that's, you know, it's interesting just hearing kind of that timeline, Courtney, because I think cartilage lesions can present in a lot of different ways. <clears throat> and obviously you're most privy to how your own knee presented, but Maybe think back to when you were 16 and when this first happened. Do you remember the surgeon saying at that point that you had any cartilage damage or was the knee totally normal at that point, aside from the ACL, obviously? You know, at the time, I, you know, I, I, I don't, to be completely honest, I don't remember if I, um, if the surgeon talked to me about any um, cartilage damage at the time, I, you know, and, and to be quite honest, I think the only things I really understood were, you know, the ACL, you know, the, the ligaments and maybe the meniscus. Um, and I know that I didn't have any meniscal damage. Um, but to be honest, I can't remember if they talked about any other cartilage damage at that time. And I would say that that's actually perfect because I think that's super common. Um, you know, these ACL injuries happen in a young, active population. And even as you get in your 20s and 30s, people are probably just not quite as active with things like you're talking about cutting, pivoting sports. And so 
I often hear patients think back and say, I don't really remember. I was in high school at the time. They just told me I had an ACL tear and, and we did surgery. So, but I think oftentimes it's not there at the time. And, um, and I think they probably would have told you that and it would have been part of the discussion back then even, but your story I think is very relevant to a lot of folks because people do tend to get injured when they're doing a lot of impact cutting pivoting activities. And sometimes these cartilage lesions really just progress and you just don't even know that they're there. So one of the interesting things that, you know, you mentioned some of your symptoms and maybe I'll bring you back to that is cartilage lesions do tend to present in different ways. Um, can you, you know, go back and speak a little bit more to that, that you were having obviously some pain, but what, what else did you feel in terms of swelling or mechanical type symptoms and, and things along those lines? Yeah. One of some of the first symptoms I was having mm -hmm. was specifically while I was running. Um, and I don't know if that was maybe, mm -hmm. you know, somewhat of like the impact. Um, but I, I definitely felt the first pain and uh, symptoms when I was running. Um, initially it was just contained to like when I was working out, you know, and then I would take, you know, NSAIDs and I would be fine, you know, a couple hours after working out. Um, and the less physical activity I did, the less pain I would have. Um, so that was probably like the first couple months. But then over time, it progressed to, um, you know, the first probably day to day activity I noticed was going up and down the stairs. I had stairs um, in my apartment at the time and would take the stairs, you know, at work. Um, and I was having a lot of pain um, just going up and down the stairs. There was one point when I felt like I couldn't even take the stairs anymore. I needed to take um you know, an elevator at my job. Um, and then sort of as this was going on, um, my knee would get quite swollen um, throughout the course of the day. Um, and every once in a while, I would have um, what I would describe as sort of like a locking type sensation. Like if I felt like I like moved the wrong way too quickly, um, or pivoted, um, my knee would just kind of lock and that was much more like significant type of pain that I would get that would, you know, last for maybe a couple minutes at a time. Um, but I felt like I couldn't really walk on it, you know, during that. And then that would sort of pass eventually. Yeah. And it's, it's so common. I feel like in my patients too, to hear what you said, where there's some things that are fairly consistent, like, Hey, it bothers me pretty consistently on stairs. And then sometimes these just more random things. And I, I think that's one of the challenging things sometimes for patients with cartilage lesions, much like you, where it seems like it was progressive over time. It's different than say an ACL where it's like you remember exactly when that thing popped. It was a very clear before and after. And it's, it's often not that way with cartilage lesions. But <clears throat> I think one of the hard things for young people is, you know, you say, well, I tore it when I was 16, you dial forward a decade, you're still only 26. Like you're, you're young, you know, you have a long time ahead. You work in a job where you're on your feet, you're really active. And I think we see that a lot from the surgeon perspective where patients just slowly kind of pair their activities back over time to the point that when they step out and look, you know, look at life and say, gosh, I'm just not quite where I want to be. So I don't know, for you, was there a tipping point, so to speak, or something that was a catalyst when you finally said, all right, th this is when I've got to see somebody, I got to take care of it. I may be nervous about what they tell me, but I've got to go in. My, my tipping point was, um, you know, it was probably, I, I, I actually remember, I mean, you know, I was at work and, you know, I think people were kind of seeing me kind of limp around and they're like, Hey, you know, like what's going on. Um, and, you know, I, I tell people I probably waited a little bit longer than I should have, but I was, um, I was just a little bit, um, you know, I think to your point actually that you just made was I was a little frustrated because, you know, I didn't, I didn't have another re-injury like my ACL. I remember like that moment in time when that happened and this was sort of just this kind of like chronic onset. So I was a little frustrated and I was nervous about the idea of, of being told that I would probably need another surgery. Um, but it got to the point, you know, just with my job that I maybe wouldn't be able to do that, you know, as I normally would. Um, so that was sort of the final push that, you know, that made me realize that I needed to talk to someone and figure out what was going on. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting that it always it differs person to person. And that's one of the things for us as surgeons that, you know, hopefully we do well is trying to individualize that side of it um, in terms of the treatment algorithm. But I'm interested to hear what some of the questions you had coming in were, you know, you'd been 
kind of progressively dealing with it, it sounds like over time. And um, some of the things I hear people ask a lot when, when they're diagnosed with a cartilage injury, which may be just from an MRI that say your primary doc ordered or your team physician or whoever, but you're kind of coming in to see a specialist and people often ask, you know, what's causing the problem? Cause it can be multifactorial. Like you're talking about, like I had an ACL, there's a cyclop lesion. There may be other things at play. Um, but other questions like, what are my options? What should I expect? What's a reasonable timeline look like? I mean, were those things that were going through your head at the time? Exactly. You know, I, I didn't even, I think the, the big thing, honestly, was that I didn't even know that I could have a cartilage defect like this, you know, in my, you know, in my mind, you know, I kind of knew the anatomy of the ligaments and, you know, maybe the meniscus, you know, from my prior knee injury, but I didn't realize that I could have the type of cartilage defect that I had, you know, so my big question was, you know, we, how did this happen? And, you know, why did this happen? Um, you know, which I think became a little bit more clear as I kind of understood more what was going on, um, that, you know, I may have had, you know, some sort of you know, tiny micro injury, you know, years ago when I had my ACL, um, you know, that then got progressively worse um, over the years. But, um, you know, that was the big question. Then, of course, well, how do we fix it? Right. And how quickly uh, will I recover after fixing it? Because the only surgery I had known at that point was uh, my ACL repair, you know, and, and obviously the, you know, kind of looking forward to the rehab process with Macy, that's a lot different. And that's something that I, you know, um, that I, you know, I didn't really understand fully at the time, but now being on the other side of things, um, it's a very different like post-surgical experience from, from, you know, like an ACL repair, at least the one that I had. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I think surgeons and patients both can be intimidated by is that two-step process or the two stages. Did you guys talk about that in your initial discussion with your surgeon, like how he framed it and, and what he talked about in terms of the options? Obviously, Macy was the one that you went with, but, you know, maybe in terms of other options as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we did, um, I, I think, to, to be honest, the first option that was presented to me um, was the um, cadaver um, implant option. Um, and I, you know, and I had my Macy a um, couple years ago now, I think it was at the very end of 2017. Um, so I, I it was my understanding too, I think Macy was pretty new at least, um, you know, in terms of surgeons that were doing it in the United States then. Um, but the the first option that was presented was the, um, the cadaver implants. Um, and, you know, over the couple of months that I got to know my surgeon, you know, and, and we were sort of trying to figure out what would be the best option, um, Macy, uh, Macy came up, um, you know, at one point, um, mm. I had already had my first initial arthroscopy to sort of, you know, look at the defect and kind of, you know, clean up the cyclops and some other things in my knee. And it was after that initial um uh, surgery that I had with him, then we started talking about Macy um, and what that would entail in terms of, you know, needing to go in again for a biopsy um, and then eventually moving forward with um, with Macy, if that was the, you know, what what I chose to do. Yeah, that, you know, that staging scope or that initial stage where you go in there, I think can be such a helpful thing for patients, kind of like, you know, what you're talking about. And you know, one of the, the nice things about this from a surgeon perspective and from a patient, too, is it gives you the flexibility of waiting, you know, that your knee was clearly bothering you quite a bit. But sometimes we encounter and maybe some of our viewers have gone through this where you see an unexpected cartilage defect when you're there for something else, say like an ACL, where <clears throat> you may not be symptomatic from it at all. And so you'd be hard pressed to say, well, we have to do surgery right now. But you've had that scope, you know, the defects there, it's nice to be able to take a biopsy, and then it gives you the flexibility going forward, too. So I don't know if you guys talked about that at all in terms of the timeline of when you wanted to do it. It sounds like you had, you know, quite a bit of demand as far as work. But did that factor into the discussion for you at all in terms of the timeline of what option you chose? It did. That was that was a really important factor for me. You know, of course, I wanted, you know, before we even got there, you know, I just wanted, mm -hmm. you know, his thoughts and and to know, you know, what is the you know, what is the outcome data look like? You know, if I decide to move forward with Macy, you know, is that um, what does that look like compared to other surgical options? You know, so once I sort of felt 
confident, you know, in, in that, then, um, then the most important thing for me at the time was being able to schedule my surgery, you know, with my job at the time, um, I really didn't need to, to plan ahead, um, and to schedule it at a time when, um, basically I was able to sort of accommodate it. Um, and so that, that for me was, was sort of, you know, okay, I can schedule it, you know, six months out for my biopsy, I know I can take time off that, um, you know, let, let's do it. So that was very, very important for me. Yeah. It, it, you know, I think that factors in a lot of times for people as well, and it depends on the situation, obviously, but maybe go back to when you were talking about the, before the surgery, about the nature of the problem. It sounds like you talked about the cartilage damage. You talked about different options. Uh, one of the things that I try to tell all my cartilage patients is, this is a tough problem. It's tough to be young and active with a cartilage defect. It, it, did you have that discussion to some degree with your surgeon as far as, you know, when to pull the trigger on surgery and how it related to your symptoms? We did, you know, we, we talked about, you know, um, a little bit of that and sort of what, you know, my, my expectations I think would be, you know, after surgery, um, you know, and of course, at that point, I also started doing physical therapy because I hadn't, you know, really been doing it until I, um, you know, met with my surgeon and sort of had a better understanding of what was going on. Um, so even just getting, you know, in regular PT and working on, you know, my range of motion and things like that was was really helpful. Um, but yes, we did sort of talk about, um, you know, and, and it, it was just nice to sort of say, you know, this is frustrating, you know, like, how did this happen? You know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have, you know, an ACL tear moment. Um, so it was just kind of nice to, you know, to talk to someone who, you know, treats, you know, patients, you know, like me yeah, every day and kind of give that, you know, assurance that there were surgical options out there that, you know, he believed, you know, could be really beneficial and help to resolve some of the symptoms I was having. Yeah. When, you know, one of the things I think we can do as surgeons, hopefully that helps patients is to lay out an, those options in a way that people understand. Uh, it sounds like, you know, you talked about a variety of options, which is good to not feel like you're pigeonholed into doing one thing. When you talked about Macy, you know, how did he frame it? Like, did you, you know, just in kind of simple terms, what did you hear when he was talking about that? <clears throat> as opposed to you mentioned kind of the cadaver option, like an osteochondral allograft, which is a more structural plug, so to speak, of bone and cartilage. But how did he frame Macy that helped you understand what it was? Uh, so he, um, he, you know, basically said that Macy um, is a surgery, you know, that is using your own cells, um, you know, that um, he would take like a tic-tac size of um, cartilage from a non weight bearing portion of my knee, um, it, you know, as, as part of a biopsy. And that would be basically sent to a lab, um, in, you know, on the East coast and that those cells would be grown more or less to the size of the defect that I had. And that at a future, you know, point, um, that that would be reimplanted back into my knee. Um, something I do remember was um, sort of the description of kind of what you just said, like the plug, you know, that the the other option was sort of like, in my mind, the way I understood it, sort of like a more type of sturdy tissue that kind of would be implanted and would maybe allow me to be, you know, maybe a little bit more aggressive, for example, with my physical therapy afterwards versus Macy, um, you know, the nature of it, um, it, it, it sort of, you know, meant that I would need to have, um, not necessarily more gentler, but just maybe a more kind of structured, um, rehab, um, after surgery and that it, you know, it may be a little bit longer. It may mean that, um, you know, I may not wait there, um, you know, as quickly as, you know, I'd like to, um, and that, you know, he was sort of very clear to make sure that I kind of understood that as best as I could going into, um, Macy, that the rehab experience was um, very specific afterwards. Yeah, I think that's huge, actually. We'll get to that maybe when we talk about your recovery timeline, too, because I, I do think the rehab is a tremendous part of the success with Macy and, and with a lot of knee surgery in general. But, it, you know, as you were talking about growing the cells and everything, one of the things that patients sometimes say to me, people have a variety of reactions to that. Some people go, wow, that's wild. You can grow my cells? That sounds like science fiction. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 
the nice thing is it's been around for a long time. You know, you, you mentioned sure. um, that you were interested in the data and the outcomes, which I think we as surgeons should be, but really patients should be too. You know, you're, you're invested in the success of what happens here and may see this current iteration has been around for a few years uh, in the U S but it had been around for quite a bit longer in Europe, which is nice to know, but that technology of growing cells in the prior generations really has been around for couple decades, which for me, and I wonder for you, if that factored in just knowing, look, this is not something that's new. And my surgeon got excited about because he just saw it um, in a video or at a conference, but there's actually some data behind it. Like there is a long history or a track record of success. Did that factor into things for you at all as you chose what to do? It did. Yeah, that was, that was very important to me. And, you know, the first thing that you know, I did, of course, after he, you know, presented this as an option was, you know, I wanted to do my own research, you know, and I did, um, you know, before I kind of got back to him and told him that I wanted to move forward with it. Um, I, I really, you know, wanted to make sure that um, I got as much information as I could, um, you know, to sort of understand, um, you know, to sort of understand like what the surgery meant and, and, you know, what people were, we're saying about it in terms of, you know, kind of outcome and things like that. Um, but I was also very, you know, drawn to the fact that it was something, you know, really innovative. Um, I thought it was really cool that, um, you know, we were going to use some healthy cartilage that I had in my knee and sort of implant that. Um, all of those things really, you know, spoke to me and, you know, I'm in medicine and I thought, you know, this is a cool opportunity to sort of, you know, do something new and, and innovative and be part of something. Um, So all of those things, um, you know, I think, again, also really kind of, you know, pushed me towards, you know, ultimately feeling confident to decide that this was the right um, decision. Yeah, no, that's very neat. Maybe talk real quick just about you've made the decision for surgery, you kind of worked out the timeline with work, You, you have a fairly demanding job, maybe just at a high level, what did he give you and what did you understand as far as kind of expectations about what's going to happen and what the recovery looks like? You know, I use something called a roadmap that I give to patients, but you know, did you have a sense of that? Like what is your next year of your life look like? I did. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I had a, I had a little bit of that. Um, we sort of talked about, I think, for example, like how long I would need to be, you know, on crutches, you know, after surgery, um, you know, and how long I would, you know, maybe need to be in physical therapy. And of course I wanted to know, well, you know, how soon can I go back to work and, you know, how, how soon will I be, you know, back to normal. And, you know, if I want to run, like when, when will that happen? And um, so we, you know, we talked about a, a little bit of those things and I know it, there's a lot of unknowns and it sort of depends on, you know, how you're progressing with PT and, and, you know, how the pain is, but, um, you know, initially, you know, my, my most, the, the, the biggest questions I wanted answered were, you know, what was the first month basically going to look like after surgery and how long would I need to be on crutches, you know, wearing, um, a knee brace and and things like that. So we we talked a lot about that. I think leading up to the surgery. Yeah, and you had mentioned earlier, and and I kind of alluded to my my personal view is that the rehab is such a huge part of that. Um, certainly, in the early part, it's restrictive, uh, as you're you're getting at. But um, it sounds like you had already worked with a physical therapist a bit before, which is oftentimes an experience for patients, whether it's recently or maybe a few years back from another injury but did your therapist have experience in macy had you talked about that at all before you went into the surgery that's yeah that's a great question my so i was actually my physical therapist first macy patient um and but i was so i was i had such a great relationship with her i had been in physical therapy probably for about six months um, prior to my Macy because I had a little bit of a longer course from the biopsy to the Macy um, and then the prior surgery I had. So I had been working with her for about six months um, and, you know, it went, she was really transparent. She's like, I've never taken care of a Macy patient before. Um, but I do remember after surgery, um, I did have sort of the rehab book that I brought to her. And I think my surgeon's office actually like sent her like images and things that they had taken during the surgery for her to sort of understand, um, kind of what was going on. Um, and so, uh, but yes, it was, 
just at the end of the day, I think it's, I tell people, I think it's more important to have a good relationship with your physical therapist, you know, and then we were able to kind of work through it together. And I had a really good uh, post rehab experience with her as well. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I love hearing that because I think rehab just makes such a huge difference. And, you know, our goal is to get you better, right? And that it's a team effort for sure. But I think our role as surgeons oftentimes is really to set you up well at time zero. You know, when we leave the OR, our hope is that we've done our job in terms of fixing your ACL, implanting your cartilage, repairing your meniscus, whatever the case may be. But really your ultimate outcome, there's a lot of time between when that happens and, and when you get back to the things that you want to do. So I think partnering with a good physical therapist is absolutely huge. And, you know, as you've alluded to, you don't necessarily have to be one of these therapists that's done Macy for a long time. You know, you were early in the U.S. Macy experience. So probably a ton of therapists at that point hadn't seen Macy and even now maybe have not. But um the nice thing is that rehab guidelines are really easily available. I think as technology and <clears throat> the user interfaces improve, that's been been really, really useful too. And some patients, I think, like that too, being able to just look through the booklet and say, like, oh, yeah, like this is helpful for me to know mm -hmm. at two months, I'm probably going to be doing this. At three months, I'll be doing this. I really love to run. It sounds like that was a big part of it for you. And that's really got cut down over the course of the time before your surgery. Like, all right, I'm looking ahead to six months or seven months or whenever they release me back to it. But um, I think that's good. I really I, I love hearing that you had such a good recovery timeline as far as that goes. So can you talk maybe a little bit about like just the day to day and the early going to about you had to get back to a physical job? And it sounds like there were some time constraints with that. You know, what, what was that like in the early going of taking time off and then transitioning back to work with still having some restrictions? Sure. So I, I was home for about two weeks um, after my <clears throat> surgery, um, you know, just being at home and using my my motion machine. I forget what it's called, but, you know, to kind of get some of my range of motion back. I think I had started physical therapy um, towards the end of that second week. Um, and then I went back to work, um, you know, at, at the like two, three week mark. Um, I was on like modified duties. I was, you know, still on my crutches. I had my full kind of, you know, leg extender on at that point. Um, you know, and, and, um, and I was like that, at least on sort of modified duties, probably for my first like two to three weeks back at work. Um, and I was going to physical therapy twice a week in the beginning. Um, and then eventually, um, I think around like the, I want to say like close to like six weeks, I was able, I think to like drop down to one crutch, which made things a little bit easier at work. And then by two months, um, I was, um, off my crutches. Um, so doing more at work, still wearing, um, that, uh, that leg brace though for, for a little while longer. It's impressive actually to go back that quick, you know, especially with the nature of what you do. And I think you're, you know, it sounds like you had the discussion with your surgeon ahead of time, which is really good. But afterwards, you know, what we're thinking about is we're trying to balance the biology of of healing and truly in this case, not just saying we want to let it heal, but those cells growing um, with the reality of day-to-day -day life. You know, you have to get back to work, you have to make money, you have to um, have this certain set of expectations and balancing that with what's best for your knee. So mm -hmm. uh, what about things that were challenging maybe? I mean, is there anything that is much research and discussion as you've done? It sounds like you really did your due diligence, but was there anything that was harder than you expected, easier than you expected, or something that you wish you would have known that you could kind of tell prospective patients? I think something that came up with, with my case, um, and this was, I think this is just something that no one would have been able to sort of know or predict, but um, I did have a lot of quad atrophy um, after my surgery. Um, and I do think that it maybe um, it kind of maybe delayed me sort of in progressing in physical therapy afterwards. Um, you know, like, for example, like I, you know, my physical therapist, you know, could, you know, bend my leg, I, I was able to get a lot of like passive, you know, range of motion back mm -hmm. fairly quickly, but I couldn't even lift my leg and, you know, on and off the exam table or out of bed or off the sofa, I like physically had to lift it on and off um, for a couple of weeks. 
Um, and I think, you know, when I was thinking about, or when I was wanting to come off of crutches, you know, my surgeon's like, Hey, you know, not a good idea. You know, if, if your leg gives out, you know, you could fall, something could happen. Um, you know, so that was something, um, you know, that I, I, I had not experienced it. I think to the level, you know, for example, with my first surgery, um, it seemed like it was a little bit more after Macy, but again, I think that was something that just happened. Um, you know, that, that was more so frustrating for me as I was wanting to make progress in physical therapy. But once I got my quad working again, I mean, I made a lot of progress, I think fairly quickly, um, fairly quickly in PT after that. Yeah, it's, it's a very common thing just with knee surgery in general. As you said, I think there's some variability uh, with it from patient to patient. And I'm constantly amazed. Sometimes we'll have these high school or college athletes that are in tremendous shape. Like it sounds like you were in very good shape still before your surgery and the quad just totally shuts down. And then maybe you have somebody that's 20 or 30 years older and their quad comes back right away. So it is variable, but it does really affect your life, you know? And so there are things I think like that, that come up and sometimes they're just not that predictable, but having somebody like your therapist and um, your surgeon kind of tell you, Hey, this is okay. Uh, but you also don't want to push it. Like the last thing I want you to do, and I tell people this a lot, the last thing I want you to do is fall and, and hurt your knee or break your leg mm -hmm. or hit your head or something like that. So, um, well, how, how about your ultimate outcome? You know, you're a few years out now. Um, can you give us kind of an honest assessment of where you're at activity wise, symptom wise, day to day, still working in the field that you do? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing great. Um, you know, I, I was basically, um, I was basically graduated around like six months from both my, you know, physical therapist and surgeon. Um, I, you know, I walked out of PT at that point and, you know, they basically told me like, Hey, you know, you know, do whatever you want, as long as you're not having any pain. Um, you know, and like cognitively, I was a little bit nervous, you know, to do that. Um, although like physically I felt great. Um, you know, I saw my surgeon a year out from surgery, um, and he had an MRI done, you know, that looked at, you know, the graft and the knee and he's like, you know, things look great, you know, surgery, you know, seems like it worked really well. How are you feeling? And I'm like, I feel great. Um, you know, so at that point, um, it basically I, I was able and I'm able to do whatever I want to do in terms of activity. Sorry, my dog is here too. Um, but, um, you know, I, I have been running less than I, I was prior to surgery, not because I can't, it's just more of a personal decision in that, you know, I'd, I'd like to um, protect the longevity of my knee since I've had a couple surgeries in my lifetime now. Um, but, you know, I cycle, I hike. Um, I do, you know, some more higher impact activities. I don't have any um, pain with physical activity, um, nor do I have any pain with it with the day to day like I was prior to Macy. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, you know, what, what I tell folks is, gosh, my hope is that we can get you into a better place. You know, I can't promise you a perfect knee, but my hope is that I can improve your pain, improve your functioning, get you back to the things that you want to do. And I think that's where there's a lot of potential with cartilage surgery and something like Macy is that it's not just uh, quality of life, but you've restored your activity and your, you know, your overall health and wellness is significantly improved with time. So it's, it's great to hear you're back to doing that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I think it just makes a, a tremendous difference, especially if you, you know, kind of look where you were five years ago before surgery, it sounds like your trajectory was kind of going down and down and down in terms of activity. And, you know, now maybe you self-select and say, I'm just not going to do certain things, which is pretty normal for any of us as we age, um, but that you have the ability to do whatever you want. I mean, I, I love that as a surgeon. We love seeing that in patients, um, getting them back to whatever they want to do. So, you know, well, maybe the last thing before I let you go is you have kind of a unique perspective being a, a patient, but also doing this Macy ambassador program uh, where patients have the ability to kind of interact and, and ask questions and things. Anything that you'd want to say on that front or um, advantages that you've seen to that program in terms of how it, it lets people interact with uh, Macy before they make that decision or before they have surgery? The ambassador program is, is really, it's so special. I mean, I wish, you know, I always tell people like, I wish that the ambassador program was around like 
you know, when I was trying to make this decision, um, because it would have been so nice to actually like talk to, you know, like someone who had gone through it. You know, I think again, at the time that I was doing it, it was maybe a little bit on the earlier side. So I didn't, you know, I didn't really know of, of many other people that were moving forward with Macy. Um, there were some other people in my PT clinic at the time who were, um, who were pursuing, you know, other surgery options. But, but in any case, I think it's so valuable because, um, you know, people ask me, you know, what did rehab look like? What did you do the first day after surgery? What did you do a week after surgery? Um, and those questions, I think only people, you, you can really only get answers from if you've, you know, gone through it yourself. Um, so I think for that reason, the ambassador program, um, it just gives a lot of insight to those really kind of granular questions that people are really interested in, I think, when, when, you know, when, when it comes down to, um, you know, deciding to move forward with Macy and then what things will look like afterwards. Yeah, I think your use of the word granular is really good because I think sometimes people are even afraid to ask certain stuff with surgeons and probably for most of us, myself included, I've never had Macy. I've done a lot of Macy procedures and seen people recover. So I have maybe a broader perspective as far as kind of outcomes and history of it than an individual person, but being able to talk to somebody like you who's lived it and say, like, here's what it was like the first two days. Here was my first week. This is what it was like when I went off crutches. Here was it like to get back to work. Like those things are just super valuable. So I, I agree with you. I think it's a really neat program and um, something that I, I hope prospective patients continue to avail themselves of because it, it really is a neat thing. So well, great. Well, we really, really appreciate your time. I'm so thankful for you taking the time to uh, spend with us here and answer some questions and have a conversation about it. Um, we're certainly glad you had such a good outcome. Love seeing that in patients. And um, we appreciate you being with us today. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, sort of talk about my experience. So thank you so much. Yeah, very welcome. Thanks for being with us. Take care. You as well. Indication. Macy. Autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane is made up of your own autologous cells that are expanded and placed onto a film that is implanted into the area of the cartilage damage and absorbed back into your own tissue. Macy is used for the repair of symptomatic cartilage damage of the adult knee. The amount of Macy applied depends on the size of the cartilage damage. The Macy film is trimmed by your surgeon to match the size and shape of the damage to ensure the damaged area is completely covered. Limitations of use. It is not known whether Macy is effective in joints other than the knee. It is not known whether Macy is safe or effective in patients over the age of 55 years. Important safety information. Macy should not be used if you are allergic to antibiotics such as gentamicin or materials that come from cow, pig, or ox, have severe osteoarthritis of the knee, other severe inflammatory conditions, infections or inflammation in the bone joint and other surrounding tissue, or blood clotting conditions, have had knee surgery in the past six months, not including surgery for obtaining a cartilage biopsy or a surgical procedure to prepare your knee for a Macy implant, or cannot follow a doctor-prescribed rehabilitation program after your surgery. Consult your doctor if you have cancer in the area of the cartilage biopsy or implant, as the safety of Macy is not known in those cases. Conditions that existed before your surgery, including meniscus tears, joint or ligament instability, or alignment problems, should be evaluated and treated before or at the same time as the Macy implant. Macy is not recommended if you are pregnant. Macy has not been studied in patients younger than 18 or over 55 years of age. Common side effects include joint pain, tendinitis, back pain, joint swelling, and joint effusion. More serious side effects include joint pain, cartilage or meniscus injury, treatment failure, and osteoarthritis. For more information, please see full prescribing information at Macy.com.